all right, all right, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Ujima Hour. You know, I've given you a, a you know early sneak preview of what's about to happen in this conversation. Um, so yes, uh, thank you all for tuning in to this evening's edition of the Ujima Hour. I am Michael Tekken Strode. Um, you know, I, I am the coordinator of the Colonet Collaborative and co-facilitator with the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. And this, uh, the Ujima Hour, is a space uh, where we explore through uh, intimate and formal conversation uh, the Black social and solidarity economy and the folks who are represented within it. Um, we are a space that is thinking through um, ways that, that the economy, um, way, way, thinking through the economic equity um, in, a, in a much broader frame, right? You know, there are lots of ways that people interact and engage with the economy. And so here in the Ujima Hour, we want to make sure that we are representing um, all of those different ways that people are interacting and engaged in the economy and, and specifically, you know, um, what the solidarity economy looks like through a black lens. Um, I had the opportunity, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago to uh, host a panel um, at the World Social Forum um, for tra of World Social Forum of Transformative Economies, uh, featuring um, Kali Akuno from Cooperation Jackson, featuring Nia Evans of the Boston Ujima Project, and featuring Dominique Pearson of Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance. Uh, you can find that broadcast on the uh, Colonet Collaborative Facebook page, so be sure that you uh, go ahead and check in to the Facebook page for that most recent update. Um, but one of the things that that um, we that was 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 certainly to be discovered in that conversation, um, and w which is not unusual for those of us who have been engaged in this space um, for some time, is really just that um, the ways that we approach and the things that we prioritize um, are distinct and different, right? Um, and so it's it's really important that. Um, as we are thinking about communities that are shaping um, and engaged in this solidarity economy narrative, and as we are thinking about what are the strategies that we want to build, what are, that we want to engage, what are the institutions we want to build, what are the ways that we want to see our community thrive and flourish? Um, and I will shy, I will deliberately shy there away from the word development um, as uh, something a discussion um, occurred with uh, Kamal Rashid back, you know, in um, 2018. Um, so you, you'll look back for that. But just because, you know, uh, what are we developing towards? Who's, who's driving the development? Um, so that, that's a very serious inquiry and awareness that we should be um, engaged in. But as we are seeking to have our communities thrive and flourish, what is it going to look like on the other side? Um, and certainly, you know, in that conversation, um, you know, there is, there is the what that is on the other side of, of all of the things that we are resisting. Um, and that what is, is still to be determined. It's TBD, right? We don't know what it is. Uh, while there are some prefigurative things that exist now in terms of the, the, the approaches to the solidarity economy around housing cooperatives and community land trust, um, we don't know what it will be. But what we do know is that we uh, need to be in conversation with one another um, around how we collaborate so that we can design what it will be, right? You know, ultimately, we want to be in that design conversation and the solidarity economy for me and in my work and in my engagement is more so about how we collaborate, how we connect and how we design the conversation of what's going to exist on the other side, rather than trying to be prescriptive and say, this is what it's going to be. This is the institutions that are going to show up. You know, um, we don't know that, um, but we can we can we can think we can we can have a North Star. Which brings me to my next point. Um, so I, I recently finished this past Sunday um, with the Center for Popular Economics, their Economics for Emancipation um, workshop, or, 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 or I don't know if you call it a workshop. It's not really a workshop. It's a, it's a five, it was a five week virtual series. They normally do it uh, over the course of five days, but it's economics for organizers, you know, um, organizers who are confronting uh, conditions and, and challenges in our community what would it look like to design uh, a miniature economics course um, that accomplishes and that gets the information around economics to those organizers so that they can build, you know, um, arguments that consider these economic ideas. Um, I'd like to highlight that it was very valuable. Um, it was a, it was a valuable experience, uh, certainly for me personally. Um, and, and, you know, there was some opportunity to to. Uh, nudge the facilitators and just, you know, give them um, kudos, you know, because they, they were really doing some work in, in building out that space um, in, a, in a way that really engaged the subject. Uh, 
you know, sometimes you get into the, you get into subjects that are dry um, and dense. Certainly economics is one of those subjects, productive and unproductive value and work, you know. Um, but they they really they really they are also themselves, you know, um, engaged in, in, in a space of organizing. So they are looking out for the needs of what organizers might need to know, what arguments they might confront. Um, and you know, one of the last conversations we had was about the sort of national debt anxiety. So when we, when you know, folks talk about, um, you know, the the government spending money, you know, there's this net. Where's this national debt anxiety? What? But the debt's going to go up. We don't want to leave the debt to our children. Um, and actually, some of the stuff that I learned in that economics for emancipation course helped me to diffuse an argument that someone was making to me about. Uh, reparations raising our taxes <laughs> and and um, you know I mean uh, th it was a very necessary argument that like look you know um, there's been several different bailouts and there's been several different occurrences where you know governments kind of you know sloshed money onto the streets right um, and and you know you can't actually make a case that you know um, that those things have actually resulted in a, ri in a, in a rise in taxes um, there's no sort of correlation that you can kind of cite historically there. So it, it but but it was a it's a theoretical conversation, but certainly um, we're going to encounter, you know, I mean, these straw man arguments um, when we are, are, are challenging the systems that we are challenging. And economics for emancipation is one way to get, you know, your analysis going, turning around how you respond um, if you choose to respond. Right. You know, um, but everybody's got their work. Right. So um, one of the things that, that I shared during that um, session was uh, this North Star meditation. Um, so we, we'd open up each session with uh, some type of grounding exercise. And, you know, I had the opportunity to ground us in the fourth week. And during that um, exercise, I, 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 you know, developed a North Star meditation, right? Um, and, and, it, and, I, and developed loosely, right? Because I'm sure there's someone somewhere else doing this North Star meditation. Um, but effectively, the grounding exercise was related to some of the things we had studied around um, liberation, you know, historical liberation uh, fronts, right? And um, we, we talked about Henry Highland Garnett, and we talked about David Walker, right? You know, and, and, and of course, you know, uh, the great grand uh, robust Mama Harriet Tubman, right? Um, and, and, and what the sort of, um, what their approach was in terms of what they were thinking when they undertook the activities they undertook, right? Um, because you, you don't go into that unless you have a vision for what's happening on the other side of the activity you're doing. You don't, go, you don't face down death um, in the way that they did, um, you know, if you don't actually have a, have a vision of what you're, you're heading towards. So this North Star meditation uh, was something that, you know, called people to, to, to dig into what their North Star is. What is it that's guiding them towards the, the more liberated future that they're working towards? Um, and and, and it, it started basically with you visualizing the North Star. And I'm going to give you today um, one of my North Stars uh, that I have been blessed to meet in this life, uh, Natanye Davine Stewart, um, who has recently passed away. Um, but, you know, someone who who in the course of two years taught me a tremendous amount about what it means to convey information and, and you know, all of the ways that information becomes absorbed. And I did not realize how much of a genius she was until she was no longer here. Um, you know, that's that's not necessarily anyone's fault. You know, two years is a relatively short time to really get to know folks. Um, but, you know, I could only appreciate that in the company of other people who knew her throughout her life. And, um, you know, we're able to absorb some of that genius. So I give you a few moments of meditating and reflecting on Davine um, or whatever your North Star is, right? What is it that's guiding you towards the future that you're looking towards? And if you want to take a moment and just look to the North, right? Look to the North and visualize what it is that you are heading towards. What's drawing you there? What are you following? And how will you feel when you get there? What's going to happen in your stomach, you know, when you get there? What's happening in your heart when you get there? How, is your, how does your skin feel? Um, so that's a very brief, brief moment in that North Star meditation. It's certainly, you know, um, not, uh, we don't have a container large enough to really contain the full meditation. 
uh, which really involves, again, you know, you taking your moment to hold your hand to your, your chest or your heart and then facing the north, right? And, and then just again, imagining yourself moving towards your north star. Um, so so I give I give credit and, and, and praise and honor to um, Davine Stewart for being a North Star uh, for myself personally and, and, you know, dare I say, for Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group uh, as a whole, you know, uh, a key member of our core team and a key member in the lineage of the work that we do um, with whom we will never forget. So um, that stated what am i reading nowadays right um so i've actually just wrapped up um or i'm near wrapping up uh better work together which is the story of in spiral um you know which is is something of a mystery like you can't really call it a cooperative because it's not necessarily a cooperative it's a it's a consultancy of consultants they all own the organization in some sort of way um but you know, beyond uh, sort of trying to explain what Inspiral is, uh, this text better work together has actually convinced me that I need to become a governance expert. Um, so, so I've really been digging into everything that I can recently that will that will um, help me think through the sort of anatomy of collaboration, um, the anatomy of working together, the the the, the dynamics of really engaging in um, that ongoing work to uh, help groups cohere. Um, so, you know, Better Work Together uh, has been a critical text that's kind of opened my eyes and just kind of nudged some some thoughts around that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I certainly uh, advise that you all uh, pick up a copy of Better Work Together, take a glance at that, um, you know, and, and, and mark your passages. And, you know, when you find some things in there that resonate with you, feel free to post them to the Colada Collaborative page. We'll, we'd love to engage in that dialogue around that. In addition to Better Work Together, um, I... Uh, dug into Beatrice Briggs' Introduction to Consensus, which um, is, you know, uh, not necessarily near as, as, as uh, you know, um, uh, as, as thorough or sort of, you know, engaging as better work together. But it's it really is. Um, I, I even if people don't use consensus for meetings, I advise that everybody really dig into and learn consensus because it's really about the thinking about structures, right? Thinking about the ways that we come together and gather and how you intentionally design a space that's going to make sure that people have the information they need to make decisions, if they need to make decisions, or participate in discussion. It's really a space design question. And so, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, advising that folks, you know, again, you don't have to use consensus to know consensus, but knowing consensus actually would make any meeting process better. And, and I can, you know, um, attest to that in sort of real life from the, the engagement that I've had recently with the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network and Dill Pickle Boards. Um, you know, just being able to have those tools in my toolkit when I'm sitting in a meeting can make that meeting more productive, right? You know, um, and, and help help to facilitate the process. And um, the final thing that I'll, I, I want to lift up is that um, this past... Um, Saturday, yeah, this past Saturday, uh, National Public Housing Museum uh, hosted a screening um, and a keynote. So they had a keynote from uh, Shirley Sherrod, um, the, the great, uh, you know, mag, uh, magnanimous, gifted, you know, Shirley Sherrod of New Communities um, in, Incorporated Land Trust uh, down there in Georgia. Um, and, 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 you know, um, just terribly, you know, um, disrespected and, 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 and shifted out of office during, during one of the Obama administration. So, you know, um, it, it's, uh, but it, it was an important conversation around um, the sort of teaching around community land trust. So giving people the, the information that they need to understand what the community land trust model is, but then also uh, like we do at Cooperation for Liberation, really grounding in, in, in this notion that, um, that some of these structures come to be from communities who, who actually have the problem to solve. And so, yeah, new communities in Georgia and, and you know, um, and, and, and small landholders and small farmers in Georgia actually had a problem to solve around access to land, which was that, you know, racism and white supremacy kept land out of black hands. Um, and so uh, so so that's what, you know, I want people to pick up from this idea uh, around the black social and solidarity economy. We've got problems to solve. Um, I'm just convinced that we too often choose the wrong tools to solve them. And so, you know, we could argue over that on a different day. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it is certainly, you know, um, something that, that I, am, I am feeling very much. Um, and fortunately, 
we've got some experts out here who are giving us new tools to, to solve the problems that we need to solve. Um, and we've got one of them on the line with us tonight. Um, so, you know, who we'll be speaking with tonight is going to be Elizabeth Carter of uh, formerly of Urban Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center, now in private practice, um, supporting entrep black entrepreneurs, startups, small businesses, cooperatives, nonprofits, and, um, and, and really engaging in this notion of democratizing access to business capital. Um, so, you know, we, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, this conversation. I had an opportunity to um, engage again in, uh, in, in something, in, in Elizabeth's um, discussion or, 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 or presentation to, um, for law, um, what was it? Lawyers for Black Lives, yes. Yeah, so uh, Renee Hatcher hosted that Solidarity Economy um, webinar on, with Lawyers for Black Lives. So I had an opportunity to engage in that. So we'll get into some subjects around rebellious lawyering will really, you know, um, get an understanding of Elizabeth's work in practice and really what brings people to this work. So that that's the that those are some critical questions that we're going to touch upon tonight. And so uh, with that, I'm going to bring our guest in this evening. Uh, to, 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 if I can actually find my scene and boom, there it is. And we have Elizabeth Carter with us on the line. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, yes, yes. Very welcome. Um, so at, before I begin, um, I have I've been saying that full name. Do you prefer Elizabeth or Liz? Which uh... either is fine. I've you know I've been called Liz, Beth, so I, I go by either. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. Um, well, yeah, you know, welcome to the broadcast. So why don't we start with you know um, you know bios don't really tell us the story, right? Um, so you know, help us walk the road with you. What's the road that brought you here? Um, and, you know, and, you know, be as expansive or as brief as you choose. You know, just tell us how, tell us how you got here to where you, the work you're doing now. Oh, that's interesting um, because it's de it definitely evolved and I would say narrowed um, or more specific. Um, but, but definitely the heart has remained the same. So I, I, I would go as far back as college, but won't spend too much time in that, that era. But, um, my awareness of the sort of disparities when it came to race and class um, my freshman year at University of Michigan. Um, I, you know, growing up, you know, I would hear, uh, so, so first generation college student, um, you know, mother low income, you know, raised kids on her own. Um, and so I definitely understood just as much as a kid can understand, you know, as far as economic position and, and differences, but it was more so, it wasn't like something that was real to me until I became, like I said, face to face with other similarly situated students in terms of I'm sitting in the class next to you. Maybe, you know, before you were on my television, right? So it was like something else further away. But now it's like, okay, we, we come from different worlds, but yet we're in the same positioning. And why is that? And so then from there, I started taking certain different classes that would talk more about identity, more about, you know, race issues, class issues, and more social justice oriented sort of aspects. I had those discussions, was able to have those discussions with brilliant professors that was able to frame the language in a way that I was able to, you know, better sort of articulate as I'm explaining and talking about my own experience, but also just what I saw collectively, uh, particularly with the black experience. And so I then majored in African American studies, political science and philosophy, and you know, that just really made my understanding of this issue really the black issue which is a political issue and i say that to this day you know you can't be black in america and not be political and i don't mean republican versus democrat i mean truly political and everything about our existence is politics i mean from the beginning of this this founding of this nation the i the, the concept of blackness like what we're going to do with this black being is a political decision with a, a legislation that was put forth and so we just can't afford to just ignore that. And, and, and you know, obviously we have other aspects to ourselves, social, you know, social lives, which we should always remember that as well. But I, I, I was early, I guess I was politicizing college, right? And so from there, um, I said, you know, I always knew I wanted to be a lawyer just because of something my mother told me to do. But in college, it kind of got more like, okay, what type of lawyer, right? I, I really didn't know that you could do anything with the law, right? You knew the criminal, corporate, um, and maybe that's about it, right? The typical, even now, like family members, oh, you, can you do this for me, this criminal? Like, I don't do criminal law. <laughs> but people typically, in the, especially in private areas, know lawyers with criminal law, right? They don't really associate it with environmental or housing. or And so for me, I was able to understand that there's different ways to practice the law through college. But it really, when I got to law school, I knew I wanted to do public interest law 
prior to law school, my, my personal statement was, you know, about, I can remember to this day, it was uh, I wanted to in- help increase the agency of others. And that was my, my philosophy, you know, background with free will. And I did a thesis on the over-criminalization of black people in America and basically argue that, you know, the yeah, we talk about race and we talk about the or systematic racial issues and policies and economics and poverty causing people to commit crimes. What we don't talk about is how that diminishes or uh, decreases agency and ability to do. If you're restricted in your opportunities, any human being, black, white, otherwise, would do what they have to do to preserve life, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, in, at that time, said, well, well I want to be a lawyer to help expand these opportunities. So I, I had a mind I wanted to be a transactional attorney, um, although uh, I didn't really fully understand what that was to law school. But I knew I didn't want to do a litigation. I knew litigation wasn't going to get there. So anyway, I get to law school. I said, I want to be a, 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 a lawyer that helped increase the agency of others. And so I wanted to figure out how could I actually do that. So I initially started with, you know, landlord tenant and public interest and working at a housing court in Brooklyn. And that's when I first heard of housing cooperatives. Um, I was working as an intern uh, with Michael Grenthal from, at the time, South Brooklyn Legal Services, a brilliant public interest attorney. And, these one, and our clients wanted to take over a building as part of a receivership. And I was like, what is that? And what, what do you mean they're going to take over ownership? Like, and he's like, yeah, a housing cooperative. And he gave me more information to look further into it. And my job grew up in the Midwest. So, you know, housing cooperatives are much more common in New York City. So here I am in, in New Jersey, New York City metro area, going to law school, coming from Michigan. I'm like, what is this concept of housing cooperatives? Although I do remember in college, there was a housing crop, a couple of them on campus. But I, even then, I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and so I'm like, oh, what is this concept of housing cooperatives? You mean tenants, you know, who are typically disempowered and, and, and at a lower power imbalance when it comes to landlord tenant get to become their own landlords? And I was like, yeah. And that, so from there on, I just fell in love with the concept. I'm like, why aren't there more of these? Like, what? And how come there aren't many of these and across the river in Newark? Like, what is going on? And we should be advocating for. I thought I felt like I found the new, the you know, the the, the, the new space age of the revolutionary tool of solving all our problems. I really did. Like, I felt like co to solve everything. And so that that's what I did. I started in the housing context, affordable housing, advocated for housing cooperatives for that, and, and eventually. Um, I graduated with a, a master's in urban planning as well, so I got some of that community development, urban development, especially the, the history of renewal and a lot of that concepts to kind of equip me with the subject matter to be able to use law in that area. So community development was my thing. Um, and then so, you know, like I said, internships that was closely got me more and more closer and closer to my, experience, or, um, I guess, interest in trans, community transactional law. I also went from sort of landlord tenant to affordable housing to working housing development unit at you know legal aid society in Harlem where I worked closely with housing co-ops and and it kept getting closer and closer. So by the time I graduated, um, I wrote a a law review article partially to sort of help guide my own sort of now I'm graduating. You know, I've been in school forever at this point, and now you're going to be in the workforce. And what are you going to do with all this skills and knowledge and all this under you know this this brain power that you have. And so I wanted to challenge myself. So the law review article I wrote on intentional communities and how lawyers can uh, support that and how urban planners can support that and what needs to be done with that particular lawyer or urban planner in order to best do that. In other words, a lot of unlearning to do. So that's where the, my understanding and first concept of rebellion came, where I read about uh, uh, Jared Lopez, once you count on vision, the, the author uh, or the engineer of rebellious lowering and what that meant. And back then it was so new, like in terms of community transaction law, because you know lawyers are typically courtrooms and, and representing, or sort of like this elite sort of system. Whereas he was saying, no, I'm part of the system. I'm ready to work on behalf of the system. How can I work with other community members? How can I work with other professionals? How can we do this collectively? to end this, you know, the status quo, who's going to take that. And so I really, you know, really fell for that um, and really wanted to, to, to use that model for my own concept of lawyering as I entered into the, the legal world and workforce. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, I, from there on, that was the motivation behind the creation of Urban Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center, a multidisciplinary, wanted to combine the urban planning with the law, with the advocacy, with the education, with the community organizing and saying, it's going to take all of this to change the world, or really to change, you know, the the, lo- the community at which we were in. We started small, right? But again, 
the idea was that we can replicate this all over if we wanted. We can partner, we can, you know, and, and as you see, you guys in you know, Chicago at the time, I wasn't there, but this is happening all over. People were thinking of these alternative collective uh, ways of doing, and here we are in Newark, New Jersey, thinking and doing that. Um, so that's what that's what um, how you sell short for our Urban Corporate Enterprise Legal Cell, our Legal Center, you sell for short started and you know really started off with education then transitioned to the organizing piece and really built a strong team of uh, organ community organizers that were from the community of the community and really just built a community essentially right and that was what the point was like the organization was a model was a tool um of way for all of us to organize and really build a community that we want to see and so certain principles consensus decision making we wanted to learn you know restorative justice we were learning um before i left and just really saying how can we really transform so it's not just about what we want to do so it's not just about creating cooperatives it's also about creating procedures that are alternative as well right so not a majoritarian system where some are left out or disadvantaged because they're just not the greater voice and, and, their, and their voices aren't heard right it's, it's about countering that and saying how can all of our collective voices be heard for the greater common good um it's also about not just throwing someone away because they commit a harm and not you know the person feeling ashamed to admit or to take accountability because it's about now it's about healing right and so we, we really thought about a lot of that because I think solidarity economies and cooperatives is more than just the legal structure. It's more than just an economic tool. It's more than just a housing unit, right? It's, it's also about a way of life. It's, it really is. Um, if that's how you have, it's intentional to do it that way. I mean, many, I, you know, depends on who you're speaking with. You know, you have people who create co-ops and it's just a housing for them, right? You have people who create worker co-ops, it's just an economic means for them. And but for, for us, it was so much more, it was beyond economics. Um, and so from there, well, simultaneously, I, I started a private practice, um, or before that, I should say, at the same time I started so I actually began working at the city government level as special counsel or assistant legislative director. And from there, I did, I was able to do pretty great projects related to co-ops, actually. The mayor at the time had an agenda regarding co-op or city-sponsored co-op projects, and I was able to um, help lead, you know, major affordable housing cooperative projects, also, um, you know, provide counsel insight to city-sponsored worker cooperatives, and even, you know, drafted and authored legislation um, designed to promote and encourage co-op development through tax uh, subsidies. And so, it was interesting. I had a, a quick, it's almost like I just hit the ground running really quickly with the legal skills, but also was able to stay true to myself and internally what I felt and what I believe and how I wish the world would be. And then also to be grateful to have others around me that felt the same in order to build a collective vision. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of the beginning to sort of the middle because I'm, I'm in a different space now as well. But that that's the most recent history um, from there um, till now that I'm in Chicago. I wanted to figure out because again, you're growing, you're learning, you're constantly refining. And I realized that in my private practice, you know, there's so many, and I work with artists, I work with local and small business owners, um, nonprofits, mid mid-sizes, as well as just starting out, um, and really just a, a government agencies I represented. Um, so I had a, a breadth of clients and experience in transactional law, community development, redevelopment law. Um, but what I noticed with my small business clients and my artists was that, you know, they had great talent, great business ideas, but the funding was always an issue. Um, and then I got more into just just understanding and researching about the funding and capital space when it comes to startups and business capital. And I wanted to be a part of that difference. I didn't, you know, hearing the statistics that black women are the largest growing group of entrepreneurs, yet the least likely to be funded, doesn't sit well with me. You know, it's like, well, I want to, we need to create an ecosystem for these, for these sisters, right? These women, me, <laughs> right? And so we need to create an ecosystem where you have not only the funding support, but you also have the legal support. You all you have this whole support system that makes the business successful. And so that's really the motivation behind um, my law firm now, uh, Elizabeth L. Carter Esquire LLC, is to help democratize, as you stated earlier, the business capital space where I namely mostly represent Black and Latinx founders, um, and especially with emphasis on Black women who have an interest in raising larger capitals, where I have the opportunity and because of my prior experience, whether uh, my experience working with uh, founders or just my own personal experience being amongst and within the black community, I'm more culturally sensitive to the challenges that black business owners have or black women business owners have. And so we, with that in mind, I'm better able to come up with legal strat or strategies 
where they are able to leverage um, the limited resources that they have to then gain uh, you know, larger resources through crowdfunding, for instance. And an example of that is that um, actually, in coming out, I'm still working on the project, but now I'm combining my two worlds of where I came from, world where I focus on the co-op development piece, um, and now I'm connecting that world with the raising capital piece and using co-ops as a means, as actually a capital raising means, right? So technically under the securities law, a co-op is technically not a security because, you know, you'll have someone who's also managing while investing um, into a company. So security is, is when there's someone who um, invests money, let's say for instance, invests uh, actual financial dollars into a business with the expectation of return without doing anything for that return, right? So I'm just, I'm a passive investor, I throw my, I give you money and I wait around for you to make the, the, the growth happen. That's, that's the security. Whereas if I'm coming in, I might throw some money here, but also putting in my, I'm managing, I'm putting in my equity, my sweat equity. That's that's typically not considered um, what they call investment contract, or which is also security under the securities laws. And so, but the understanding that with that prior experience, we working and understanding this co-op law and, and what that means, and then be able to pair that with the securities laws, of which technically was not set up for smaller businesses like you know, uh, low income or smaller bit issues, I should say, right? Into the job deck, which kind of changed that a little bit where crowdfunding is now, um, you know, allowing smaller businesses to raise capital without having to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars to register. Whereas before that, that just wasn't a thing um, heard of. They had to either go through a bank or just kind of pull money from everywhere to, to grow their business. And so, so now, like I said, even with the crowdfunding, there are limitations and that to raise 50 million under regulation A plus, for instance, you need at least, you, at least fifty thousand. So you're looking at between fifty and hundred thousand just to have the, the the expenses to get you to that fifty million. If that makes any sense, right? And so then you're like, well, how am I going to, you know, help you know a, a black founder who doesn't have angel investors around them because the way again systematic racism and economic flow, they're not typically you know knowing they can't go to their family members and just pull you know all these resources together, which is typically what happens. It's like, oh, you just your initial private capital comes from family and friends. Yeah, but a family and friends are in the gentrifying neighborhood and everyone is trying to, you know, don't have the means to actually purchase the land in their community. How are you going to actually get to that? You're just basically saying it's still not accessible to them. So even though the, the jobs that made it more democratized in terms of securities um, raising capital, it wasn't democratizing enough for many of our, our marginalized, underrepresented issuers. And so with that in mind, I have to think more strategically about how to best support Black uh, and Latinx founders who are often on, again, the margins with traditional funding with banks, VC capital, we see the statistics all the time, VC fund other white men, rich white men, right? Uh, they're not funding a black woman. So how do you sort of navigate that space? So I say all that to say that, you know, as we're thinking, you know, strategically how to support our communities collaborating cooperatively, one of the big uh, ways is financing and funding. But then even with that, we have to constantly think collaboratively, collaboratively and cooperative in that as well, because standing alone as an individual, whereas you know it takes collabor sharing of resources in order to even get to the where you're trying to go. You know you have to change your mindset from this individualistic approach to business or, or um, financing or you know capital raising. Absolutely. Okay. You know we can pause and take a breath, and we'll just end the show there. How you know uh, we we've run seven marathons. <laughs> Uh, so really, so thank you for for that that very complete you know um, engagement of the the character arc and you know um, how you land here now. Um, I one of the things that we covered in the World Social Forum conversation was really about um, political education, the two the two sides, political education and community engagement. Um, so you talked about some of that being present in Urban Cooperative uh, Enterprise Legal Center. Um, Specifically, I remember seeing some of maybe I think some assemblies that you all had done, like street assemblies where you had like people organizing cooperative terms. So um, just maybe give us some background on some of the community engagement strategies that you engaged in at yourself. And, you know, what was the importance of political education in this in that space that um, that that you all occupied? Oh, yeah. So so you're probably speaking of when we had um, we would do um different events in the the park where we wanted to reach the people and like you said we would have you know because we know these terms weren't 
always something that was uh, well known as far as what is, a, what is a cooperative, what is a prison industrial complex, what is a food, a food, you know, desert or apartheid, and what is, you know, what are these terms? Because as we're learning as well, um, but also as we're learning, how do we then, you know, sort of educate the broader public to then bring them in and to so even with organizing starts with education. First, is the idea to folks and to the people, and then from there have a much more immersive experience where we will actually have every bi-weekly we will have study sessions right one of the books that we read was co-op jackson and just loving their model around their organizing model and just learning and taking notes we'll also just have a strategy session right so you know for instance we wanted to acquire a vacant lot you know what are the tools local tools can we use to do that you know and just strategize around that like for instance using certain redevelopment tools um, within the city or, or, you know, that you acquire land or, you know, just saying how do we, com you know, create, you know, financial economic me uh, mechanisms in order to, you know, share and bring resources together. And, and then we will also just have the engagement piece, which was, okay, once we get done studying and strategizing together in meetings, formal meetings, we'll then go on the community and, you know, again, introduce these topics to people, um, whether it's in the park, whether it's through, you know, fun f functions that we created or started. Um, and then from there, the hope and aim is to then mobilize them and bring them into the fold so then we further then, again, organize the broader community around these topics. So it's definitely important. Um, one thing, if you look at historically the development of co-ops or creation of cooperatives in the black community specifically, it always started with these study circles, right? And just trying to get a better understanding of politics and the political economy. Because if you don't know what environment you're in, you don't really know how to transform it. And so we knew that, you said, the importance of understanding the politics and knowing that being black is political is that, that it gives, it's a starting point. So then you know how to then maneuver when you say, well, I want to make a different environment. I want to create something new. I want to create something where you know, people with limited resources can actually acquire property, right? So how can I do that? Well, first you have to understand the political economy that you're in. Okay, well, we know that, you know, um, this is the politics, this is how the politics are, are conducted. We know that, okay, we need to acquire, you know, most of, especially urban areas, a lot of land is, is city owned. How do we acquire that land? Who's the major players? Who do we need to talk with? Who do we need to agitate? Whatever it is, right? But if you, until you understand, and I'll give you a prime example. We work both in Newark and Trenton in New Jersey, two different cities, although similar issues. Trenton, for the most part, and we learned this from our organizers, because they live there, they work there, they know. Um, Trenton is predominantly as far as who are the major players, who are the major actors, and who are, you know who we have may, may or may not have engaged with, are is basically state sort of ran, right? It's the capital of the state. The state, a lot of the property is owned by the state. You know, there's major, major nonprofits that are affiliated with the state that own a lot of property. You know, problematic in their own way. Right? Um, in their own way. And then you look at a city like Newark, which is heavily, heavily. Uh, controlled by the city itself and historically right I mean Newark is a major city um, you know you don't see the same type of state influence and so the actors change right and so when we think of what is the political environment that we're in we have to know that so then we know what kind of tools or, or how to navigate that space and who and again what kind of legal tools what kind of organizing tools it's so important um, and then also just understanding having that foundation I think a lot of the times we're ready to work and we're not understanding our mutual communal values we may all have the same sort of similar goal of indie justification, right? But we're not seeing it the same way, or we're not coming at it, um, you know, say for instance, I may come at it and think, I think cooperative, collaborative, we're going to do this together, where someone is used to working hierarchy, in a hierarchy kind of way, and that can create tension in the community um, because you're not coming at it procedurally the right way. So I think it's just better understanding, you know, like you said, have, using a certain type of language, understanding the language where we all are speaking and operating from, so that we can have better working relationships. We're still human. You know, we have we may have the interest, but that can break it can break, you know, movements a lot if we're not we're bickering with, with one another. We can't even get out of the internal conflict, let alone address the external conflict. Absolutely. Um, and so you you've shifted to this conversation around um, around capital and and you know you you seem to be ingratiating yourself in a few local contexts. I saw in the newsletter that you joined the advisory board of self help uh, self help Seaway for the folks who are longtime Chicagoans. You know the old Seaway uh, Federal or, or was no the old Seaway is now self help Federal Credit Union. You know with the Seaway branding. 
Um, so just uh, tell us, you know, what, what uh, brought that invitation along. And um, then, you know, maybe you can tell me why Daryl is not returning my emails. <laughs> Uh, well, so you're right. So bridge, the, the concept of this bridging capital. So now that I'm in this space and hyper focus on assisting with the legal compliance and strategy of raising capital for um, black and brown um, it, uh, or issuers or businesses, again, that concept of, OK, you know, you'll you have some, of course, uh, come in with the resources needed for the legal support, ready to go, ready to rock and roll. Then you'll have others, uh, and that's not just limited to black and brown, but this is just um, some of the issues that you'll see with folks who are normally marginalized from traditional funding sources or even, um, you know, family and friends sources that, you know, and, and again, I think crowdfunding is, is a marketing tool, so they'll see a lot in the online, right? Oh, this person raised a million dollars, this person raised two million, I want to do that too. This person raised 50 million from 16,000 people, I want to do that, right? You're like, okay, cool, okay, 50 million, all right, well, what is your budget? And they're like, oh, I mean, budget this X amount and that amount is so, so interesting. It's not nearly enough of what it typically would cost to do that. And so then you don't want to just say, well, you, you come back when you have the money, right? Or come back when you can afford it. Or even just say, well, you're not really ready. You know, I, because we understand the greater purpose behind why they want to raise this 50 million. They want to really uh, take control collectively of the community that they, they come from. They're afraid that, you know, places like Milwaukee or Newark or Detroit is going to be, you know, turned over and too expensive for the folks who were there for decades. And so people are really saying, oh, this is a way for us to collectively raise money to buy the block, right? And so they have real larger than my individual goals to do this for sure. It's just that reality is it takes money to make money, uh, even in this democratic crowdfunding space, right? And so that's where um, the strategic framework can we do to you know knowing that reality right um as an attorney that is in the space we work between development and working with marginalized communities i understand that this is a reality right this is not something that i would i naively oh just go to a bank and just get the money right because that's just not reality right and so we have to think strategically and so with self-help being a credit union which is also a co-op and having a specific mission to support black and brown and latinx communities um they're more willing and able to also help and speak strategically about how to better support the Black and Latinx Chicago community. And so for me, I was able to connect with them and say, hey, you know, I, I come from this space. Um, I think that credit unions have a, a strong position within this crowdfunding space to be able to provide that bridge capital um, of, you know, smaller needs compared to what the bank is used to lending but large enough for this individual business owner who then can take that for the initial operations and initial, initial cost to then leverage that to raise the 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 20, 50 million, which is under the crowdfunding. Um, and so that's where that motivation came from, was really trying to fill in a gap, right? Because, you know, again, you just see crowdfunding that says, oh, this Democratic Jobs Act allows small business owners to do this, and then no one talks about the toll it takes to even get there, right? Um, no one talks about the racial, the systematic issues that prevent a lot of black and brown issues from actually doing it because it takes the upfront capital that, and they're like, well, I have to raise money. You to ask me to come with a hundred thousand, that's why I'm raising money, you know what I mean? And so it's this, this misunderstanding of what it costs to do that. And so being able to think creatively and strategically, okay, how can we create some type of product or some type of in between that allows for this this transaction to happen. So pulling from, you know, from having zero to then have this middle of 100,000 to then be able to say, I'm going to, I can use that to help raise 50 million. So that's where that, that really came from. And so I'm actually excited to, to begin that thinking, begin that partnership and seeing what we can do for the community, um, because that's what, what, you know, that's what's needed. Um, and it's, it's filling a gap of which, again, I think oftentimes these spaces like SEC, again, securities laws, you know, one of the other part of my mission of the firm, not only to help democratize business capital through, you know, support of underrepresented issuers, but also to help democratize the security legal space, because that space is heavily white male as well. And so they're not thinking of the same problems that I see, right, because they don't have to. So when you look at the SEC rules and regulations, they may or may not, they're not considering 
oh, there's a lot of people who are still left out that need the support um, to be able to take advantage of the crowdfunding, right? And they're not really seeing that because they're not being informed by that because, again, the space is not as democratizing as we like to think. And so that's part, partly of other work that I'm doing as well as connecting with other crowdfunding practitioners and Black crowdfunding practitioners to be able to help inform the broader uh, federal space around crowdfunding to make that happen. Other, and an alternative, you just make those private connections as I have with self-help, um, you know, and to be able to help do that. Um, but on a larger scheme, we definitely need something from the S Securities Exchange Commission that recognizes that there's going to be a lot of people still left out, and we need to figure out how to maneuver in that space um, to be able to better serve um, black black business owners, basically, and, and Latinx business owners. Okay, you you uh, you indirectly answered you know one of my follow up questions, which was just about educating the ecosystem, right? Um, so, you know, you talked about the, the education that happened on a community level, but um, it sounds like, you know, this with this self-help relationship, you're able to educate some of the banking infrastructure in the city about the types of businesses that, you know, are looking at these new financial models. Um, are, are there, are there, is that around what's happening with self-help? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's Part, yeah, exactly. Uh, educating, but also um, utilizing a tool that's there to sort of redirecting the resources a little bit um, and creating a, a, a viable product that will be able to do that within the regulatory framework of credit unions, right? Um, again, we're working with this framework, how can we best do that? And so they have their own, um, they already are engaged in a lot of community sort of based initiatives. And so now it's about how do we sort of create new products that makes the most sense for um, this type of sort of business capital. Excellent, excellent. Yes, and and I I really appreciated uh, the one-on-one -on -one conversation I had with Daryl. You know, just kind of Daryl Newell of uh, of self help, and you know, just really um, the historical arc that he brought. So so one day I'm going to have to get him on a on a Ujima hour segment just to really talk about the historical arc from Shore Bank, you know, to self help. Um, and sort of all of the stories that he has about banking history in Chicago and what it means to be a community development, you know, financial institution. Um, so, sure. so I, I want to go ahead and pivot. Um, and, and you, you also have noted in your bio that you're the founder of uh, Bless, or, or not the founder, but you're a co-founder of Blessin, uh, the Black Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network. Um, so, you know, what is uh, what is the work that's happening in that container? What's that uh, entity about? Yeah, so the Black Economic or Black Lawyers Economic Solidarity Network, lesson for short, um, the, the purpose of, of founding or the purpose of that network, I should say, um, actually, um, one of the members, Jerome Hughes, is what, who brought us all together, um, you know, saw a need within the legal space, uh, particularly the Black legal space, to really work together in order to better support the Black community around cooperative and other side of initiatives. Um, but again, I think. Even with you know raising capital, you know the legal knowledge and expertise is so necessary to be successful and to be compliant. Um, that even within you know when it comes to developing a cooperative or even thinking strategically about large land projects and how are we going to collectively you know manage and control that you know how is a, a particular a, a black cooperative going to do that or someone who has this idea, we come together to sort to use our our, our experience, our knowledge, our you know, our, um, you know, ability to research and just figure, you know, to put things together. And like I said, even with the concept of bringing co-ops into the securities world and just kind of strategically bring things together, um, I think that's the point is like, how do we best serve our community as professionals with all this, you know, with the knowledge, particular skills that we have, how do we bring it so that it's more community based? And I think that was the intention of Blessing. Um, is to, to better do that. Because again, we recognize that as black lawyers in the space, we have a, we're in a unique position to be better able to serve uh, the other members of the black community within this space. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, you know, uh, so for folks who are in the audience, you know, if you have questions, uh, feel free to make sure that you use that chat. Um, you know, we will be uh, taking some of those questions from the audience. So if you do have questions uh, for our guest Elizabeth Carter this evening, please make sure that you drop those in the chat. Um, we appreciate seeing Keela uh, Upton, you know, has, has dropped something down there in the chat, you know, talk, letting us know uh, about jumping on the call late. Um, so I'm sure that there are other folks who might have questions that they might, uh, that might be coming up for them. Uh, just go ahead and drop those in the chat and we'll, we'll take those shortly. Um, so 
so the the next uh, question that that I'm I'm, I'm really thinking on is um, we've talked about a couple of different layers, right? You know, we talked about some layers that are on the communal level. We've talked about some layers that are at the business level. We've talked about some layers that are at the capital and finance level. Um, I'm really interested in um, in connecting maybe those first and last layers that, that mentioned just, you know, how do you demystify capital and finance to folks in the community, you know, who might, uh, you know, I mean, we, 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 we have sometimes, there's sometimes challenges and there's sometimes, you know, shame around money. And so, you know, how do you demystify this su subject of capital and finance to folks in the community so that they can realize what tools they might have available to them? Well, that's a good question because I, I, I... <laughs> My understanding and concept of money has changed over time too. Um, and even with you, so, you know, Urban Property Enterprise Legal Center, we were very clear that we wanted to engage in economic exchanges beyond money. So we were very clear about creating an internal time bank, which is the exchange of services and focusing on, you know, barter. I even had barter arrangements in my firm where, you know, in exchange for, you know, a client, in exchange for, I don't know, actually, yeah, one of my launch party. I had a catering company, um, you know, cater the event in exchange. I uh, drafted an operating agreement for her and her partner, right? And so, just under and I wanted to be intentional for that as well, because because I knew, you know, they weren't in a position to actually afford at market rate what the legal service would actually cost. But at the same time, this is something that we need. I felt responsible for as a community attorney to be able to make myself accessible as I do now, right? Accessible legal services um, and to, to black and brown or underrepresented issuers, and so you know, barter and, and time banks. So I think to, dem to demystify it, how I got to the point where I'm focusing on hard capital, actual money, um, and not just barter or s services, is just looking at it as a means and a strategy. Um, it's not the only, right? It's not It's not the main, it's not the the, the, the overall, the, the high, it's not a hierarchy, it's just about the need and a strategy. And so, like for instance, I still, again, going back to, um, co-ops and seeing that as an economic tool not just a legal entity or even just not even community organized because we see i see co-ops in all types of sort of categories right as a community organizing tool as a community development as a in this case we're raising capital i see it as a financial economic practical tool so you have two small businesses who are operating alone or about on your own similarly situated in the same say say industry say a restaurant two restaurant you know or cafes they're operating in the same community and yet, you know, like for instance, since like COVID are being hit hard and can't really operate alone by themselves. So then a concept will be, will come together as a co-op where, you know, your employees as well as the two owners, say it's a single member uh, owner, LLC, come together as a cooperative and actually be able to share the cost of doing business, actually be able to leverage the resources that they have to then be able to use that 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 so once they get the operations flowing again and sharing the, and dropping some of those costs and, and be able to strategize these two brains and rather than one to be able to strategically focus on the market and how do they get viable you know business in then to be able to say well we want to grow let's use this this money that we've made and in the stable you know sustainable operations to then raise larger capital through regulation crowdfunding right um, so it's all about seeing all these things as strategies and means and even within that co-op there's bartering going on right there's time they're sharing a call there's sweat equity so a lot of like you know for instance i'm actually forming a black woman owned platform cooperative and how we're investing is through our sweat equity we're all talented and skills coming in from education to from law to finance and we're just marketing and we're just putting all together and creating this company but imagine if we let money stop this and said we don't have the money you know or we don't want to invest this we have other things going on um, we're just not going to do it. No, we can get this done because we have the skills to get it done. And so it's all about, and it's not to say that we're not going to raise money later on, right? So it's all about looking at it as ex exchange, means of exchanges. And that's what helped me when I started, because I, you know, economics was like a thing, like what? Even in law school, I never saw security law as something that was applicable for me or my community. I never saw corporation law, really. It was just like, how is it helping people? You know, because really how they teach it, it doesn't show the connection with community. So what, how, how I'm approaching how others in, in the space are approaching it, community capital really is merging two worlds together and demystifying, like you said, and, and this this concept that this is for them and to think, you know, we can use an important tool to for our community. And then, you know, simply seeing money as a means of exchange, just like exchanging services, just like exchanging uh, goods. Um, it really is giving gifts. Like it's about keeping 
the community productive economically, socially, and keeping things moving. So I would just say that. I mean, look at it as it's a means. It's not the end all be all. I'll look at it as what you do. You're doing it be for be for greater than money, but not without money, right? Uh, especially when money is still a, an important factor. But there are people who do operate simply without money. So there just depends on your needs and depends on the strategy that you have. Uh, but simply, money is a means. It's not the end all be all. Yes, and that certainly mirrors, you know, a conversation we've had earlier on the Ujima Hour, which really talked about those eight forms of capital, uh, financial, intellectual, living, material, cultural, experiential, social, and spiritual. All of these different ways exist for folks to exchange. Finance is one eighth of that. Uh, so, you know, um, definitely you know, knowing how to engage these other forms of capital that we have access to uh, changes the dynamic yeah. and changes the definition of what we call an under-resourced community. Um, you know, so I, I will uh, reach out and dig into this very, uh, you know, uh, sizable question from Keila Smith Upton, uh, which says, what is one of the best ways to focus on getting community development, pre-development funding support uh, prior to having a site or site control if the focus is to develop people and members first? Um, so I, I, I can reread that question if you want to chew on that one more time, if necessary. Yeah, I mean, I think I heard it, but yeah, maybe paraphrase a little. Yes. Um, so I, 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 I will say that um, I know that um, that Keela has uh, been working on potentially an artist cooperative um, in the city. Okay. And so and so I think uh, what's what's uh, what she's saying is that, you know, they don't have a site yet. They don't have any site control. They're, they're just they're they're looking to, to think about how to get the pre-development funding. So maybe that initial initial bridge you know, to get them to the point where they can actually launch the development or, or actually build out or something. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I don't know if the group is already formed, um, but I will focus on the people development piece or in terms of the community organizing piece first and getting a holistic group um, and then seeing what resources you have within that group. Um, whether it's initial financial capital or as we talk about the sex, what equity and get what you could done then. Um, but if you really, because it sounds like you're trying to acquire land or at least lease land, you're definitely going to need financial capital, right? And so I would say, um, going back to the example, and I don't, it's hard to answer because I don't know their financial situation, but going back to the two examples with, you know, forming a cooperative and using that to then leverage a larger capital raising ass. There's rewards crowdfunding, which is not a securities at all either, but you can go, there's um, a black owned, woman owned, fun black, uh, funblackwomen.com and funblackfunders.com that allow you to raise, and this is another strategy, right? And as we talked about within the crowdfunding space, black crowdfunding space, you know, there's ways for us all collaborate and in different platforms to be able to support that one business owner. So that rewards crowdfunding, it, it has lower cost because you don't need an attorney necessarily to help you with the compliance of securities, right? Because it's not, it's technically not a security. So use that model or use that to get your initial, right? Um, after, I will say, after you form your collective group, your internal, um, you know, sort of a pool of money or your pool of resources, then leverage that with something um, even larger with the rewards crowdfunding, then leverage that with the uh, investment crowdfunding, um, um, but before you even get there, there, obviously there's a cost to get there. But then by then you'll have through the rewards crowdfunding sort of your startup capital cost to help raise that larger ad. But if even if you didn't, right, I think at that point, whatever you, you raise on that rewards crowdfunding, you can then probably go to, say, for instance, self-help credit union and speak about the micro uh, lending loans that they will have. <laughs> um, or other, I think there's other organizations in Chicago as well that do micro lending, right? And say, well, this is what, and I don't, again, everybody has their own underwriting, but this is something that, you know, we'll have to look into to see the specifics, but this is something that I'm looking from a sort of a abstract point of view, you know, using these different uh, sort of collective means of raising capital to then uh, leverage further capital raising. Um, so long story short, internally, pull the resources together, you can use a model such as rewards crowdfunding. Um, there's a fee, a fee attached to it in terms of percentage of what you raise, but you can at least save costs on like the legal and accounting costs when you do that. Use that, you know, money from there to then leverage additional uh, fundraising, whether it's through investment crowdfunding, or whether it's through bridge capital loan, uh, depending on what stage you're in, to then maybe raise even larger capital. So, so that's what I would say as from the outset. Um, hopefully, I, I, it was helpful, but. But again, it just depends on what level of stages you are in. I'll have to see, look into your situation much more intimately. Um, but that's 
an outset, I will say. I mean, but this is the type of stuff that I, you know, I, I work with clients and trying to figure, okay, well, all right, here's this and here's that and here's this tool and let's pull all this. Like really, literally creating a capital stack um, in order to better help. But I think it sounds like she already did the most important part is getting the people organized and, and on the same page and forming that sort of initial cooperative, even if it's not legally formed yet, but that initial collective, uh, which will be the most, the, the, the foundation of the organization before you even start raising capital, the, the most important part. So I think she's well on her way. Okay, okay. And actually, there were two clarifying comments that did come in in the meantime. She, met, she noted that the group is not already formed. Um, and then there was also a question to repeat two of the websites that you had mentioned. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Fun, F-U-N-D, Black Women, B-L-A-C-K, dot com. And that's for specifically for Black, uh, found, black Women Founders. And then, um, no, I'm sorry. Fun Black, yeah, funblackwomen.com. I'm I hope I got it right. And then the other one is funblackfunders.com. Either way, if you find, I know Fun Black Funders is one. And yeah, it's funblackwomen.com. The computer just popped up. And the other one is funblackfounders.com. Okay. Okay. And we'll make sure to drop those at shortly. Um, so uh, in terms of just this, this um, you know, this question around crowdfunding, um, I know that uh, recently, and you know, this is this is sort of a you know a, a tangent into um, some of these land-based crowdfunding pro uh, pl programs. So recently, um, in New Orleans, House of Tulip, you know, at this point in the matter of about of about three weeks, has raised about three hundred thousand dollars towards a community land trust specifically uh, for uh, Black, um, non-gender conforming, or transgender uh, folks. So. Um, I'm, I'm interested in whether or not, like, like, you know, you've talked about some of the work you're doing around crowdfunding. Do you also participate in, like, helping people to shape an attractive crowdfunding opportunity? Is that part of what you do, or do you leave that to some other person inside of their, their space? Wait, wait, tell me, kind of clarify that. Do I help you oh, shape well, the crowdfunding? Well, you know, um, so, so House, House of Tulip, one, they had a very attractive story. Um, they also came in a moment, you know, where everybody wants to put money in black people's hands right now. Um, so I'm just wondering when you when you're talking about crowdfunding, are you, um, do you are you helping people to shape the narrative around the crowdfund? Like, you know, here's the good way to kind of put a crowdfund offer out or or is, or is that like somebody else who does like messaging around like, you know, what 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 you should are, are you basically just doing the law portion of like, here's how you actually need to package this security? Or do you also help people think about, you know, how to shape what they're what they're saying and what they're putting out for the crowd? Both. So I, both in different ways. So I, I, I recently am part of we're, we're, we're new. We're forming um, a black crowdfunding coalition. So this is I'm an attorney. We have someone who does marketing for uh, crowdfunding issuers. We have once platform owners like a woman Renee King who owns uh, FunBlackWomen.com, we have equity platform. We you know hoping to have investors and just everyone in this space to come together to inform not only policy but also sort of the internal standards and how we go about you know making sure that this remains um, a viable option for uh, our black community. Uh, so in that way, helping to inform that space with my own experience, you know, saying okay, I personally would love to see crowdfunding issuers to have a business plan. Right. If you're going to ask people to give you money, people want to know what they want a part of it, what they what they're investing in, how the money is going to be used. It's sort of and then it works. It helps for you because you're able to better communicate what it is that you're looking for and how you're going to go about it and what, what's this vision for your business. And so even with my law practice, I, that's something that I advise clients to do is to say, OK, what are you here's something that you should have. I'm not necessarily. And, I do help inform the business plan, let's just say that, because there's language, there's certain things you need to have in there. And then also, like you said, I do help form some of the marketing um, in terms of the language, because that's when it comes to equity, you have to be careful how you're structuring the language as well and how you're putting out the disclosure. So yes, on both ends, on the legal end, I'm focusing solely on the compliance aspect or the strategy, strategy compliance aspect. And then on my, you know, sort of um, professional, other professional support, and I'm helping to inform um, amongst other practitioners in the space who come from different, you know, um, walks of life when it comes to crowdfunding or raising capital from the, the public, 
in that way, like I said, I, those folks who solely will help you with the marketing. And that's marketing and getting it out there, reaching as many people as possible. Because that's one of the main things with crowdfunding um, is it's the marketing. It's a big public advertisement um, aspect of so the platforms are for. So yes, yes to both. I know it's a long way to answer. I typically do that. <laughs> but it's never a short, quick answer for me. But yeah. <laughs> No, no. And if we didn't, then the law books and the law stacks would be much, much briefer. Um, so, yeah. So we we are, are at that closing period. Are there, there you know, ideas or, or thoughts you want to leave folks with in terms of um, how they approach and how they should think about, you know, what should they think about before they call you? You know, procedure. Be- yeah, I would say procedure. In terms of, I would say, be, not even just before they call me, just before they start to engage in work, even with amongst their own community, really get down that value structure, your mission, collective mission, your collective uh, a vision, because that will save you a lot of headache later on. You don't want to do all this work, working together, organize together, then to hate each other because someone said this or did this and then do this right, right? Or, and then you have to go through the whole, just, you know, because you're going to have this, we're humans, things are going to happen, but I think we can save ourselves a lot of headache if we focus on our collective vision. And that includes when you come to me as a client as, um, before you seek legal service, come to me with a business plan, a vision. I want to, what are you trying to do? You know, how can I better, that helps me help you, right? Or even, you know, there's ways for, you know, if you, again, if you're looking for investors, you should always be able to communicate visually as well as um, verbally what you want to do. And I think that's all about the procedure. You know, it's always good to have, like, I want to do X, Y, Z. I want to engage in the work. But how are you going to get there? So on both ends, whether you're organizing, get that collective foundation in order. And then when you're coming to the attorney, get your so basic sort of foundational paperwork, like your business plan, really, um, in order. Um, in order to be able to better communicate what the offer is, what, what, what your company is about, how you're going to, you know, serve the community, how you're going to use the money from the community, you know, these type of questions. So, procedure, get that down pat. Yeah. Well, excellent. Yes, that 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 is an answer that I can get down with. You know, to my earlier, you know, uh, notes around me just really desiring to be a governance expert just because I've been in so many terrible meetings and, you know, and, and instead of being uh, someone who comes out of the terrible terrible meeting and is like, why am I in this meeting? Um, I, I'm really trying to figure out the best strategies for facilitating from the sidelines, like, you know, really helping someone who's badly facilitating the meeting, just like, hey, let, let's get you back on track. Like, there's people that are disengaging um, and there's, there's a problem there. Like, you know, um, there is a, I mean, you know, there, there are uh, several, you know, uh, local, um, I mean, regional, regionally local, um, you know, situations of embezzlement that incur, have, have occurred in spaces because um, folks got really comfortable with disengaging in meeting spaces and, you know, not, not being attentive to what was happening. And so the, there's an opportunity to, um, for, for us to kind of catch some of these challenges on the front end um, if we are engaged, if we are attentive to our procedure, and if we know what that is at the outset. So. I appreciate you lifting that up, and um, thank you. And I just want to uh, let folks know before we do go. Um, you know, there are a couple of things. I, I first, um, I'll I'll note that I did put uh, Elizabeth's website in the, the chat. So uh, www.elcesq.com. Um, LLC.com. Oh, Oops, no, 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 no. You're right. You're absolutely right. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. No, I don't know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, so make sure you uh, check out that website, www.elc.elcesq.com. You know, uh, the, the the wonderful uh, Elizabeth L. Carter is, has lots of information there. Um, and you you're doing a radio broadcast um, on a regular basis. Is that what's happening? Or a podcast of some sort? Is that? Are you? I, oh, oh. Well, no, not, well, not, <laughs> you're speaking things to existence for my life, Mike. No, uh, right now, what I'm doing, I partner with uh, a few business, small business development centers here in Chicago to, you know, part of, these edu- part of my, again, my role is to educate, get these ideas and these uh, certain uh, co- t- concepts out. So I have an upcoming actual workshop on the 29th at 12 p.m. Central Time with uh, SBDC Bronzeville speaking about it's really intro to business contract uh, intro to business contracts sort of an immersive experience so we talk about operating agreements talk about you know partnership agreements and even going to this this the, the idea what I just brought up about co-ops and how do we you know leverage cooperatives as an investment tool um, so it'll be great if you all can join that as well um, if you go on my um, not the website, but if you go on these social media handles, um, which is on the website, you'll find that 
um, you'll see the, the link to that workshop. So I think it'd be something that your listeners would love to be on as well, because again, these are the foundational sort of tools as you're growing and developing your cooperative or solidarity economy. Absolutely, yes. So uh, make sure you visit the website, make sure you uh, visit on social media. Um, also in the chat is uh, funblackwomen.com. So uh, make sure that you check that site out. Um, and, and, all, and coming up, um, we have Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group. We are uh, on our bi-weekly schedule. Um, we'll be back on July 26th on Sunday from 3 to 6 p.m. Um, so, you know, make sure that you check out our social media uh, Facebook page, uh, Co Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, um, at Co-op, the number four, L-I-B, um, at Co-op for Lib. Um, so you can find us on, on um, at least on Facebook, we are not on any other social media um, spaces. But yeah, check check out the, the Facebook page, um, click on that meeting time, click interested, um, and you know, just uh, drop in with us uh, from three to six, where we will likely be going through part of our cooperative curriculum, which is about procedure. It's about taking the wheel. Like, how do you design a really good meeting? You know, especially if you're about, if you're at the launch point of a cooperative venture, um, so we'll be doing a taking the wheel exercise that tries to dig into some of the complications of that. Um, so make sure you check out Co-op for Live. Uh, make sure you check out uh, uh, Elizabeth's website. Um, and, you know, we, we really appreciate you for being here with us um, on the Ujamaa Hour this evening. Um, and so I, I'm just going to, you know, thank Elizabeth again. Um, thank you. Thank, our, thank our, our participants, you know. Um, and yes. Uh, I look forward to uh, speaking to you all in the future. Uh, um, we'll be back. Um, actually, one more piece I, I have to highlight. Uh, we'll be back on, on that uh, second Monday in August, um, uh, August 10th, and we'll be talking with Gregory Jackson of uh, Sustainable Economies Law Center and Repaired Nations. Uh, so, you know, so, certainly someone that I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with from all of the various lawyer lawyery networks um, about mm -hmm. the country. Um, yeah, so I, I thank you again, and you know, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. Oh, likewise, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for, you know, the discussions and the talks as of what we need. This is all part of the ecosystem, so I'm grateful for you as well. Um, all right, folks, uh, thank you for joining the Ujima Hour this evening, and we are out. Have a good evening. Thank you.